Good morning. Good morning. Everybody okay? Yeah. All right, okay. Now. Nah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday we had a nice uh, exchange. Uh, today, because we really tried to work hard to not make this the death by PowerPoint meeting. And so today is all about going through those cases and having a very interactive session. A few things people said to me yesterday. Uh, one person came to me and said, do you really think we're doing all these things wrong? And, uh, and the answer is, no, I don't think that. And, and I think I made very clear that we're 95% there and we're trying to fix the last 5% of what we need to fix. So uh, I think a lot of things are going right. I don't know if anybody saw the news this morning. But this stuff continues on. Uh, HSBC had to pay one point, I think $1.9 billion as a settlement with the US government because they've been involved in money laundry activities. Um, I don't know if you guys saw Philips, Philips uh, televisions last week, got a fine of 600 million euros for price agreements with uh, other companies. Um, so the, it just shows you how much this, this glass house that we're living in is, is just getting more and more transparent and people are more and more on the case of, the politicians are doing it actually to make themselves look really good. So that they, that they take care of these kind of issues. Um, so, Specifically in the healthcare field, as I said yesterday, it's going to be an even bigger challenge for us to, to make sure we do it all right. So with that, I, uh, I have invited a guest speaker who is going to open up the day with uh, what I think is going to be an inspiring discussion. And the theme is every choice has a consequence. And uh, I'm sure you're going to find this an interesting um, experience, and I'm not going to say anything more. I'm just going to introduce Chuck Gallagher. Every choice has a consequence. On October 2nd, 1995, I took 23 steps. That's the distance from the door that I entered to right here. As I took those steps, I, I thought about my wife. I thought about my two children, Rob and Alex, so they were yay high at the time. I thought about my career. I thought about the community that I lived in. I thought about everything that defined who I was. In a small town in western North Carolina, I was Chuck Gallagher, I was a somebody. But on that day, as I took those 23 steps, on the 24th step, I reached out, opened my hand, and stepped into federal prison. At that point in time, I became 11-6-0-42-58, an inmate, what most of you in this room would likely define as a nobody. Ladies and gentlemen, every choice has a consequence. Could you help me with these handcuffs? Have you ever had the opportunity to be a guard before? Oh, wow. You know, the fun part is traveling across the country. There you go. You can, yeah, yeah, the, both sides. Anybody that's not acting properly, thank you very much. You will be handcuffed. But some of you have to be asking the question, okay, wait a minute, I, I don't get this. Rob has asked this um, uh, American guy to come over here who comes in in an orange jumpsuit and handcuffs 
and is a convicted felon, and why would he be talking to us about ethics? I was doing a presentation uh, probably three weeks ago, and I started off with every choice has a consequence. I got about halfway through taking my suit off, and some lady left the room. She said, there is no reason I should listen to what he has to say. So maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, some of the choices that we make and the consequences that follow. And yesterday, Rob talked a great deal about transparency. And one of the things that I want to do as we're talking here today is be very transparent so that we can kick off this morning and the case studies that you'll be doing in a way that will be meaningful to you. Now, for those of you who are the analytics in the room and you want to have something that we can work with, there is this thing up on the, the screens across the room called the integral model. And we're going to do a couple of things today so that we can kind of frame this idea of why it is that a, a, an otherwise intelligent person would make some clearly unethical choices. And we're going to look at things from a couple of perspectives. Now, in the first place, I tend to focus into two kinds of categories. The first that we have is the individual. Uh, and we're going to look at all of us as individuals in the room and what perhaps might frame our behavior. Why do we do the things that we do? And, and as an individual, I'm going to start on the left side and our <coughs> intentions, what we're thinking about, what we want, what our desires are, what our intentions are, then begin to frame our behavior. So if you're sitting here in this room, functioning as a manager, looking over the sales teams that you're responsible for, the question is, what is the intention and what is the behavior? Yesterday, for example, you were talking about meeting your uh, annual operating plans. And they're aggressive. Well, my intention is to achieve my quota, my goal, my annual operating plan, and my behavior then is going to be actions that will lead me to that. Intentions create behavior. So we'll talk a bit about that. The other side to that would be, if we go to the bottom half of the slide, this is where we're looking at the organizational side. From an organizational perspective, what is the culture of the organization and how does that create the systems that follow? Now I've had a, a, an interesting two and a half days or so here talking with different people in your culture and in your organization and also hearing about your competitors. And it's interesting because I have to say this, Rob has a culture of a high value on integrity to do the right thing, for it to be intrinsically right. Not right because it's defined by compliance or by legal, but right because it's the nature of what you want to do. That is a culture that pervades throughout the organization and creates then some of the systems that follows and in fact a meeting just like this. So when we look at this, the integral model, we'll talk a little bit about both sides of this, but my focus primarily is going to be on the individual. <coughs> Because our intentions create the behaviors that follow, and if we can frame our intention properly, then the behaviors will be natural. Now, let's, um, let's look at it from perhaps a different perspective. Here's a big target. And, uh, and one of the things that, that I hear a lot in working with companies all across the, the country and in Europe and other countries is that we are in a transparent environment and we all seem to have a target. But let's look at the target because there is a pattern that takes place when you look at the unethical continuum. The first part of this, and it always starts small, and it just keeps getting deeper. The first one is, well, okay, my action is not good for the customer. Now think about this for a second. We'll try to frame this in a, in a sales perspective. So what is it that I might do that really isn't good for the customer? Perhaps I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll use a generic example, but perhaps I have a product that I want to sell and I'm going out and, and, and it's my job to make sure I sell this because if I sell it, I hit my AOP and if I hit my AOP, I get my bonuses and I mean, this is the process and I know that product is not exactly what they're looking for. I mean, it's not, 
it's okay, but it isn't the exact thing that really meets the need. So perhaps, well, I'll go ahead and em embellish a bit. Oh yes, this will, this will perform exactly what you want. And, and, and in that embellishment, I'm going to do what I can do to lead the uh, customer to make the purchase, realizing it's not exactly what they need, but it's a sale. Now, I'm looking at you in the room, and I'm seeing a lot of you thinking, wait a minute, we make the best products, so therefore, our, clearly, our products have to be in perfection. That may not be for you the example that will uh, really connect, but there are many things that can be done that may not be perfect for the customer, but it helps us accomplish our objective. You know, no harm, no foul kind of attitude. But then we maybe go for, well, wait a minute, this is not good for the company. You know, okay, well, I can get by with embellishing a bit for the customer, but, but what, what about the company? Now, I've read your code of conduct in business ethics, and I find it really interesting because I get to see these all around the country in, in looking at different codes. And, and it's interesting because your code does something that I think is somewhat unique in that it says that fundamentally you should uh, uh, take care of the company's assets. It's your responsibility to make sure that the assets of the company are properly taken care of. However, we will go ahead and accept that there are certain human behaviors. For example, using the computer for personal purposes occasionally is all right, or the telephone, or even maybe some office supplies. And it clearly states that in your policy. Yet I go into some companies, and that is incredibly abused. Now, you know, if I am converting or using some sort of company asset for my benefit, and it doesn't benefit the company, well, then okay, it's not good for the company. Well, but wait a minute, it's a policy violation. Now we're getting a little deeper. Now, now I have violated policy. For example, I heard yesterday there was some discussion about expense reports. Now, I don't know what Rob has seen. That's not relevant to me, except for the fact that it was interesting that 50% of them had some sort of challenge. Perhaps there is something on those expense reports. Perhaps it's a mistake. Perhaps it's addition, whatever. But there may be things on those expense reports where we have clearly somehow violated company policy. So we're, we're going down the rabbit hole. It's not necessarily good for the customer. Well, okay. What's not good for the company? Hmm. Wait a minute. It's in policy violation. Or I can go deeper. It is just clearly unethical. The action taken now falls into the category that it is clearly not the right thing to do. And let me stop at this point because it's very important whenever you, you, you're in a meeting like this and you're talking about the issue of ethics to define what is ethics. So let's define it in a very simple term. Ethics fundamentally is making the right choice based upon all of the relevant facts and circumstances that exist right now. Now, I've got a general question for you. It's just a curiosity more than anything. So how many of you think that it is ethical to shoot and kill someone? Raise your hand. One, you are a brave soul. Two, do I, do I have three? Okay, I've got two, okay. So for the most part, I will ask that question and most hands are down. People are like, okay, I'm not going to vote. Now let me change the scenario. You leave here, you go home, you find whenever you get home, it's uh, you know, a, a lovely evening, lovely Tuesday evening, you get home, and about eight o'clock or so at night, as you put your little ones to bed, or grandchildren as the case may be, depending upon the age here in the room, but as you put the little ones to bed, sometime about 9.30 you hear some rustling in the bedroom and you wonder, hmm, I wonder what that is. And you go upstairs and you find that someone has broken into the house and is preparing to uh, harm your child, molest your child, or hurt your child physically. Now, how many of you feel that it's appropriate to take lethal action to protect your child and that that's an ethical thing? Raise your hand. Okay. Based upon facts and circumstances, determine what becomes the truth of ethics at a given point in time and in a given moment. So, 
It's interesting, when you ask the question, a lot of us in the room get this attitude of, well, it's black and white, and this is where it is, and it's not always that. If you go down the rabbit hole just a little further, however, you end up with where I was in the orange jumpsuit in handcuffs. You end up in the category where it has now gone from not good for the customer, not good for the company, a violation of policy, unethical, and therefore illegal. I started with the comment that every choice has a consequence. So right now, I'm going to um, break with the analytics and we'll get to the human side of ethics. So the question that typically is on most people's minds when I walk in the room is, okay, what got you there? So let me share the story. <coughs> In 1990, now that was a long time ago, at least it seems like for me, but in 1990, I was a CPA, a Certified Public Accountant. I was tax partner in a CPA firm. I had testified before United States Congress on various acts, aspects of tax law, had written articles in national tax magazines, and taught continuing professional education programs in 30 different states in the United States. So I went around teaching tax law for eight hours a day. <laughs> And people, you have to sit back and think to yourself, I've got a day's worth of ethics and I could be sitting in a tax seminar. Doesn't that <laughs> excite you? But I believe that, you know, if you're gonna do this, you may as well have fun. So we did like sing-alongs. You all do sing-alongs in your meetings at times, right? Like Medtronic sing-alongs, no? Okay. We did sing-alongs, like tax returns, tax returns, money on the way. We fill out the messy forms, but the clients have to pay. I mean, things like that, you know. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you may as well have fun if you've got to be here, right? So here I am, I was in Boise, Idaho, teaching a, uh, a continuing professional education course on retirement planning, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. Boring. But that's what I was doing. And so here we were that day, and by this point in time, we had gotten to uh, lunchtime, and this was mountain time, my stomach's on East Coast time, now I'm at 3 a.m. in the morning or so, about my time. And, and so nonetheless, we break for lunch, and in those days things were different. We did not walk around with the proverbial cell phones in our pockets, there were banks of phones outside, and if you got a message, it was not texted, it was not emailed, it was put on a little pink slip that said, while you were out, and taped on the door. So I walk out of the room, and I get this message, and here it is on the door, while you were out, call your office, ASAP. So, okay, so I'll call the office, and when I picked up the telephone and called the office, I got one of my partners, and here was the conversation. Chuck, I know you're out, and I'm not sure when you'll be back this week to our office, but you helped a client invest some funds, some money, and there's been a change of circumstance and, and that client needs to liquidate that investment immediately. <coughs> so if you'll tell me where the file is, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and begin the process to initiate the liquidation. Now let me share this with you, and I don't share this with any pride, but it is reality. The reality was I knew and God knew the truth. And the truth was, I had not invested that client's money. The truth was, I had stolen it. And I knew, as I heard those words over the telephone from my partner, that everything that I had done that was valuable, that was beneficial, that was good, the master's degree in accounting, the partnership in the firm, all of the work that I had done to create an incredible career was getting ready to collapse. It was like me having built this big house of cards and someone that day reached in, pulled the card, and as they pulled it, you knew what was going to happen. The collapse was imminent. It's just nobody knew it was a house of cards or it was an illusion. Now, I did not know what to do when I got that call, so the only thing that I knew at that particular moment was to dance. Well, I say that loosely. I, I, I wasn't really sure what the outcome should be, so I told my partner, I said, look, it wasn't like this was invested with Charles Schwab. 
So consequently, we can't just pick up the telephone and liquidate the investment. And by the way, tomorrow, I will be back in the office. So call the client, tell him, I have it under control. And meanwhile, I've got to get back to my class. Are we good? Sure. And the phone was hung up. I completed the course and they left. And quite candidly, when the room cleared, before the people at the hotel had the opportunity to come in and rearrange the room for the next meeting, I literally sat down on the risers and cried like a baby because I knew life was changing. Now, I don't know what your experience would be here, but in 1990, a long time ago, we didn't have Google. So I, I remember going to the hotel room that night, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be very candid and say this, and I know it's kind of heavy this morning, but that was a really dark night of the soul for me. Because everything that I knew was changing. And frankly, I considered ending my life. But, now I don't know if the guys in the room will agree with this, I think the ladies probably will, but as a guy, I'm not really good with pain, okay? The guys in the room, let's just be honest with each other. If it was up to us to have babies, there'd be a whole lot less kids in this world. We don't mind making them, don't want to have them. Just a little tidbit there. So I'm thinking to myself, if I'm going to end my life, anything I could think of caused pain. And I guess the lack of desire for pain perhaps kept me alive. I do remember this. I remember getting the yellow pages to look for physicians psychiatrists, psychologists, proctologists. I didn't care if it started with a P, I was interested. I needed somebody to be able to help. And I remember calling on the telephone and here's what I got. You've reached the office of Dr. Such and Such. Our office hours are from 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. You've reached us after office hours, but if you'll leave your name and number and a brief message, we'll be happy to give you a call in the morning and have a nice day. Now, if you're thinking about suicide, somebody telling you to have a nice day really ticks you off. I, you know, I just got to call it as it is. So I got that on the first call, the second call, the third call, the fourth call, the fifth call, the sixth call, the seventh call I make, and someone says, Dr. Such and Such's office, and I'm waiting for the rest of the message. And there was no rest of the message, and I said, I, I, I need to talk to someone. Now, the gentleman on the other end of the line, I have no idea, by the way, who this was. It could have been a psychiatrist, psychologist, or the janitor. Don't have a clue. But the person on the other end of the line said, oh, I'm so sorry. I was supposed to have dinner with my wife. I'm running about 15 minutes late. Otherwise, I wouldn't have picked up the phone. I thought she was the one that was calling. But I tell you what I will do. I'll, if you'll leave your name, and, and before he could get out number, I said, I'm considering suicide. Let's talk, he said. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, well, it's 2012, so this has been, what, 22 years now, I guess. But I can hear that man's voice in my head. I, I, I hear what he said. And here are the words that he said to me, and they were profound. Short, but profound. The gentleman said to me, he said, son, You've made a terrible mistake, but you are not a mistake. Let me repeat that. He said, son, you've made a terrible mistake, but you are not a mistake. Then he said to me something that was profound. He said, the choices that you make today will define the future that you live and the legacy that you will leave for your two children. Make those choices wisely. Now, I'm going to promise you I didn't sleep real well that night, but I lived because of the comments that he had made to me. Now the next day, 
I decide, okay, I've got to fly home. So I'm flying across the country. And in the process of doing that, I thought to myself, I have to talk to my wife and I have to talk to my partners. Hmm. So we're going to have a little survey in the room, okay? So how many of you think that I talk to my wife first? Raise your hand. Okay, that's the great majority of the room. Okay, and thank you. How many of you think I talk to my partners first? Raise your hand. Seems to hang over there, okay. All right, for the minority in the room, the answer was partners. Okay, I needed a practice round. Okay, I know. You, you, you. <laughs> Sometimes it's good. I mean, you know, you got to have that opportunity just from time to time to have a little practice round. So I go to my partners, and I'm going to pick on you two gentlemen right here only because you're right here. Lucky, right? So I go in to see my partners, and I, you know, they, they welcome me. They seem to be happy to see me. They don't have a clue the illusion is getting ready to be exposed. Two of my partners are sitting there. We're talking and I explained to them what I did, that I embezzled money. And one of them looked at me, I mean, I've been flying all across the United States, thinking to myself, there's got to be a solution. I mean, I know, there's got to be a solution. There's got to be some way out. I, I, I know that I've done something wrong. I understand that I've done something wrong, but there's got to be a way out. There's got to be something. I wonder what it could be. And one partner says to me, I have the solution. And my response is, yes. And then he looks at me and he says, I think you should off yourself or commit suicide. <laughs> Straight faced. He said, we don't deserve this. He said, I have kids too. He said, I've got to put them through college. Do you realize the impact that you could have on this firm? He said, you're a trusted partner in this firm, and you have done something that could absolutely destroy what all of us have worked together to build. We don't need that. And he said, frankly, you're not much of a husband. Your wife doesn't deserve that. So here's the thing. You've lived long enough. Your life insurance will pay. So she'll have money. The people you embezzle from will be repaid. And there'll be enough to take care of your children's education. Folks, that wasn't exactly what I had in mind. That wasn't the solution I was thinking about. The next partner looks at me. Some of you in the room can identify with the iconic American figure, Donald Trump. He says to me, you're fired. I expected that, okay? That one was okay. I kind of assumed that will take place. He said, you know, he said, you need to cooperate with us. And I don't know what will happen to you, but I suspect that somehow you'll end up in sales and marketing. <laughs> and in 2006, I was a senior vice president of sales and marketing in a publicly traded company in the United States. So one of the partners read my mind from the night before the other, well, We'll call it, he predicted the future. Now, let me say this to you because it's important to understand that transparency is incredibly powerful. So let me be very, very transparent and very blunt. What I did was wrong. But on that day, I became very transparent. Within six months, I had made restitution to the people that I had stolen money from, embezzled money from. Now, let me say this to you so we're clear. That doesn't make what I did right. I don't want anyone in the room to believe that I am somehow justifying my behavior. In fact, I'm going to pick on this table right here. If you don't mind, folks, I'm going to ask you a question. Assume for a moment that I have stolen money from you. Go ahead, feel it anger, whatever. And now the question is this, which would you rather have, your money back or me in prison? You get a choice. It's only one or the other, you can't have both. 
just in case. I look at some of you and I'm seeing both in your eyes. It doesn't work that way. It's one or the other. Money back or prison? Money back. Money? <clears throat> Amazing. See, all of these folks are kind-hearted. They don't want to see me behind bars. They want their money back. It's amazing as I travel the country, I speak to uh, corporations, associations, and universities. The college kids, about 50-50 or money or prison. Okay, because the college kids never had the money. <laughs> so they ain't lost nothing. So they figure, ah, put them away. But if you've had it, you kind of like to get it back. So by mid-1991, I had made restitution, and we had fundamentally agreed that I have lost my job, lost my license as a certified public accountant, never be able to practice in that profession again. Uh, I was fortunate. A gentleman that I knew offered me a job. I went from a $225,000 a year job to a $25,000 a year job, and I was thrilled that someone saw some value in me and would employ me. That's the truth. And while these folks were repaid with interest, the reality of it is the biggest crime that I committed was breaking their trust. Because that is something they will never forget and neither will I. But with all that that took place, the question then becomes, well, how is it that you got the orange jumpsuit thing? So it's mid-1991, and I'm sitting at my house, and there is a knock on the door. And I'm thinking to myself, wonder who that is. So I go to the door, look through the little peephole, and there are two men dressed, hold on, let's put the jacket on. We'll more formalize this. There are two men outside dressed in proverbial suits standing there. And I'm thinking to myself, sales folk, or religious folk. <laughs> Fundamentally one of the two. And so I opened the door and they said, are you Charles Gallagher? Now I do not know what it's like in your respective country, so let me say this so that we're clear. As I told you, I speak English in fractured Southern. I live in the Southeast United States. And in the Southeast United States, most of us have nicknames. So my name is Charles, but I go by Chuck. If you were named William Robert, in the southeast you'd go by Billy Bob. So when Billy Bob's outside playing and having a good time, if Billy Bob gets in trouble, Mama says, William Robert, you get here right now. And when she calls you by your Christian name, you know you're in trouble. That's just the way this works. So when these guys were standing outside and they said, are you Charles Gallagher? I had a feeling this wasn't going to be a good deal. <laughs> I said, yes. And they simultaneously reached in their pocket and pulled out this beautiful gold badge. I believe they got up every morning and polished that thing. It shone in the sun. It was glorious. One of them was from the Department of Labor. Criminal Investigation Division, ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974 that I used to travel around teaching, they wanted me criminally prosecuted for embezzlement. Hmm. Karma. The other was from the Internal Revenue Service. They wanted me criminally prosecuted for failing to pay tax on stolen money. <laughs> That never crossed my mind. <laughs> you know, on our tax return, other income, stolen money. <laughs> I mean, who would think? You don't think about stuff like that. <coughs> Needless to say, the wheels of justice move slowly. So on October 2nd, 1995, I took those 23 steps into federal prison. Now, the question, however, is what causes an otherwise honest person that knows the difference between right and wrong to make unethical choices? And folks, let me be very clear with this. 
there's a pattern that typically always takes place. And if we can identify the pattern, sometimes it helps us keep folks between the ethical lines. I, I don't know, I heard some folks talk the other day about India. If you've ever been to India and seen how folks over there drive, there doesn't seem to be any lines and it is wide open. I, it is terrifying. It's like, wow, I don't, in the, my wildest dreams know how they fundamentally get from point A to point B, but it's structured chaos, I guess. I don't know. But in most countries, we have the proverbial lines. And we know that if we're driving our automobile and we stay between the lines, fundamentally we'll be safe. Well, our role as managers is to help identify what are the common causes that would take an honest person and put them into an unethical position and how do we structure the lines so that people naturally want to drive between the lines to maintain an ethical boundary. So let's look at it. There are three components to ethical lapses. Now I'm going to use again my story to help illustrate the three components. However, I think we'll also be able to look at in practical application what's taking place in your world so we can see how this applies. So if we have a three-legged stool, I have wanted to travel with a three-legged stool, but, but uh, the TSA will not allow that to take place because they say when you unscrew the leg of the stool then it becomes a, a weapon and you could use that on a plane. Of course, I could handcuff the flight attendants to the drink card, and that seems to be perfectly all right. But I'm not that I've thought about doing that or anything, but I, you know, look at what happens. So here's the three-legged stool. So let's talk a little bit about how in the world did this whole thing start in the first place. I want to rewind the tape a little bit to 1987. I'm going back now a ways. In 1987, my first son, Rob, was, had been born, late part of 1986. This is January of 1987, and I get a telephone call. Call comes in from my local banker, David. And the call goes something like this, uh, Chuck, this is David from NCNB, that eventually became Bank of America. NCNB, by the way, stood for no cash for nobody. Bank of America adopted that, fun <laughs> fundamentally. Well, you got to call it as it is, nonetheless. But David's on the line. He says, Chuck, he says, it looks like there's a bit of a problem here. He said, uh, we don't have a record of your house payment being made for two months. Is there a problem? Well, there was. The reality was, First child was born, my wife and I went on the, ex well, we bought a lot of stuff for the kid, let's put it that way. I mean, you know, the kid was born at the end of November, and it, I mean, after all, his first Christmas was just there, and Santa Claus had to come for a one-month-old that had not a clue they were in the world, but whatever, learning experience. So I was, in fact, behind on the house payment. In fact, the way our company paid was a nominal salary each month until the end of April, because that's in the United States when individual income tax returns are filed, and we got substantial and large bonuses then. So sure enough, I was behind. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, if I tell David I'm behind in a house payment, Will he refer any business to me? After all, I am a tax partner in a CPA firm, and after all, our responsibility is to help other people with their money, and if I can't manage my own money, how's he gonna send people to me to help me manage theirs? So, quite honestly, I did the only thing at the time I knew to do. I said, David, I suggest you go check your records. I would expect that the payment has been misapplied. And the guy knew that he could not 
access the records via computer to make sure that it was correct or incorrect. So he says, well, I, 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 I don't know, but let me check. I'll call you back. And he hung up. So here I am, and the guy knew that he could not access the records via computer to make sure that it was correct or incorrect. So he says, well, I, I, I don't know, but let me check. I'll call you back. And he hung up. Now, folks, the first leg of the three-legged stool is need. And let me be just very honest with you. No sense in complicating this. I had purchased a house that I could barely afford. The payments were a challenge each month, but at the end of April it became very easy. And I was behind. I needed money. It was very simple. But you can apply this to a multitude of things. We're in a room where we're dealing with folks who are in sales. And you're talking about your AOPs. And what do we typically in sales think about? I want to meet my numbers in order to make the bonus, in order to keep the job, in order to advance within the company. I mean, we can name all of the needs, but there are plenty of needs. In fact, someone yesterday talked about the pressure of meeting an aggressive AOP. Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, that's a need. So mine illustrates what a need is, but they apply in a multitude of ways. It's very easy to sit in a room like this and to say it would never happen. Never. Say never. Because we don't know where the temptation will come in life that will create that need. I was talking in a seminar, I don't know, probably now six, eight weeks ago, and a gentleman came up to me after the seminar and he said, boy, you must have been talking to me because I used this example. I said, so what if you're a guy and you've been married for 12 years and the romance is kind of fizzled. It's just not as sparky as it used to be, so to speak. And you travel a lot, so you go someplace nowhere near home and you're sitting at the hotel bar and a cougar comes up wow. <laughs> and you find yourself somebody's interested in you <laughs> that hasn't happened for a while and you think well who's gonna know man I hate to do this but I've got to go there I mean you know which of the princes in, in the UK William or Harry whichever one was it that went to Vegas and decided he was gonna play strip pool you know what what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas Vegas not if you've got an iPhone oh no 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 somebody somewhere is gonna be recording something you can almost bet that it's going to be captured someplace I have to admit however I like the way the English did it Come home, that's fine, now we'll send you to Afghanistan and tell them. <laughs> Every choice has a consequence. It's a learning experience. I had a need. Now there were a multitude of ways I could have solved that need. By the way, is anyone here born in the month of June? Raise your hand, okay, a couple of, couple of folks. Very good, there you go, be proud of it, yes. Are you a Gemini? Uh, no. no, okay. The, the, the folks born in June that are Geminis, you know, that's supposed to be two people. Yeah, two people, right? Okay, so for those of us that are two people born like in June and we're Geminis, we talk to ourselves. Don't you talk to yourself a lot? Do you find you have some great conversations with yourself? <laughs> I really do. I have great conversations with me. I mean, some of them, and they're not HR problems. I mean, I can say anything to me that I want to say, and it's, an, it's, it's absolutely fine. So here I am, and I'm having this conversation. Now, I am the trustee of a trust. It was an educational trust for children. And they were eight and 10 years old. So there was a number of years to go. So here I am, I'm trustee. That's this person. And I look to myself and I say, you know, you have a need for some money. Now this side of me over here says, well, absolutely that's right. I need to make my house payment and I'm behind and it's real embarrassing and if I tell the banker, well, that really would not work very well for me, rationalization. And so the trustee side says, you know, we need to invest this client's money and get a really good return on the money and for the most part, we're getting about 6%. But I would consider making you a loan for 10% for 90 days. 
That would be 40% annually, but 10% for 90 days. What do you think? And this side said, you know, that would be a solution. Yes, I could tap into that. And at the end of tax season, when I get my bonus, well, golly, I could pay it off. And surely I'll be happy to pay 10% because I don't want to experience the embarrassment so this one said, you know, we've got to document this, however. We've got to make sure that this is right. And so then I went to the computer and sat down at my word processing program. Not Word. In those days, it was WordPerfect or WordStar. Like Lotus 123, some of you were old enough to remember the software programs before Microsoft kind of all sucked it in to the Microsoft jungle. So nonetheless, I typed up this, I, Charles B. Gallagher, being of sound mind and body. Now, sound mind, we can debate. Body was okay at that point. Hadn't lost any body parts yet. So here I am, and I type up this note and steal the money. Then I get the call back from the banker who says, you know, I have checked the records, and it doesn't look like, and before he could finish, I said, David, I'm so sorry. I can't believe it. Ladies in the room, let me tell you, I'm sorry I'm getting ready to offend you. I can't believe it. My wife pays the bills. That wasn't true. We just had our first baby. That was true. And she thought I was taking care of it, and, well, I thought she was. This is embarrassing. I'm going to bring a check right over to make sure this is taken care of. Please forgive me. This, I can't believe I did this. Oh my goodness, how embarrassed I am. And then David said to me, he says, Chuck, that's all right. He said, I passed a bad check once in college. And we had a male bonding moment. <laughs> because he shared with me his screw up and I shared with him mine. And between the two of us, we were okay. And I paid it. And the second leg of the stool is opportunity. The first leg is need. The second is opportunity. I had the opportunity to be able to do something that I should not have done. And the third leg is rationalization. And rationalization goes something like this. I needed the money. I had the place from which to get it. I stole it. But I was going to pay it back. And if I paid it back, therefore, it had to be a loan. And if it was a loan, it was OK. So I could sleep at night. I don't know. Let me, let me just play this out real quick. Let's go to a very common example from yesterday. I need to make my AOP. I have the opportunity. I've created these nice little fake contracts, but they look pretty good and they pass the visual test. And the rationalization is, eh, no harm, no foul. Docs are buying, docs are happy, everybody's happy, we're happy, they're happy, we're having a love fest, it's all wonderful. And we enter into the area of unethical and probably illegal. Need, opportunity, and rationalization. Now, let me be very candid with you. I did pay it back at the end of tax season. To make it right? No. Here's what I found out. It was easy. Hmm. Well, that was easy. Maybe I should do it again. And so I did it again. And paid it back. That was easy. Doesn't appear there were any consequences. It was my own little private bank. Here's a question that one might ask oneself. Okay, wait a minute. We're all partners. We all get to know what each other makes. So how is it that I'm living a lifestyle substantially different than my two partners and yet they know what we're all making? And they know none of my relatives died, so therefore there is no inheritance. But here's a reality check. I think it really plays nicely to the conversation that took place yesterday. When you are in the middle of the experience, 
the closer you are to the experience, in many cases, the harder it is to see the obvious. Need, opportunity, and rationalization. If you remove one of the legs of the three-legged stool, you cannot stand on it any longer. So the question then becomes, from your perspective, from the perspective of managers, what can you control? What can you make take place? Now some of these are easy and some of them are more difficult. So let me say that to you on the front end, okay? The easy one is opportunity. That's the easiest one. Opportunity for the most part is fixed by or created by management, senior management, and compliance. We create systems that remove opportunity. However, you can never remove it all. A friend of mine just bought a brand new Mercedes. And apparently it's got some sort of little camera. It's the coolest little thing. All these gadgets are great on cars, but it's got this little camera that looks at the lines on the road. And if you start to veer one way or the other, the steering wheel will jostle you to wake you up, to let you know, quit texting. It's time to keep driving and not fiddling around on your car. So opportunity is one. Need. Need becomes a bit more challenging. Especially in the sales world where you have people that are out more than they are in. I'm talking about in the office. But need comes up sometimes. For example, in the case of my partners and I, see you guys get all kinds of, you should win an award perhaps. But in the case of my partners and I, it might have been clear if I was living a substantially different lifestyle even though we all knew what each other made, there might be a question as to where is that money coming from? What's taking place? Or perhaps, I don't know the experience in this room, but a common experience that people have is you find out that someone is, let's say, how do I want to put this, overextended and underfunded, or they owe too much money, and creditors are calling. And if you're in an office, and you hear someone's always getting calls from creditor, the need is increased. If they are substantially below their AOP and not looking toward a bonus, there is more pressure. The need is increasing. Now, just because there's increased need doesn't mean there's a problem, but that's a starting point. Rationalization. So when we as human beings begin to rationalize in our mind that what we're doing is okay, that's a problem. And if there's anything that we can do, one of the things that training does is help people understand. If I could, if, if I could train a group to understand when the need is high and I have the opportunity and I start rationalizing doing something, that's a big quick signal. I need to back off because something is getting ready to, could take place. Didn't say it would, but could take place that will lead me to places that I do not care to go. When you're interacting with someone every day, what seems odd from someone looking on the outside on an everyday basis just seems kind of normal. So that's one of the reasons why it becomes very difficult at times to find that self-policing. That's one of the challenges and it's a very important thing which is to be able to look at what's taking place in your organization. Just step back and ask yourself some simple questions. It really still comes down to three things. Who has the greatest need? Where are opportunities that could be exploited? And who rationalizes behavior? How does behavior get rationalized? Because if you think about those three things, those are the trigger points to be able to look at. I padded my expense report. Okay, my need was uh, I took my, let's make this, I'm going to make this up, okay? Made up example. This doesn't necessarily mean it's real for this room. But I need to take my wife out for our anniversary. 
Uh, I don't have enough credit on my credit card, but I have a company American Express card. So we go somewhere, we have a nice dinner, and I make up a doctor's name and I put on the receipt to turn in because, now let me think about that. There was my need, my opportunity was the company American Express card. I turn it in with a fake name on it, now I've lied. See, I'm trying to figure out how I can do this without lying. So now I've lied because my rationalization is they don't know how hard I've been working and after all, a third of the doctors I can't even talk to because they won't play with the Medtronic rules. I mean, good golly, if I was working for somebody else I might be able to do that and surely they owe me at least a dinner. I mean, really. Need opportunity and rationalization. I don't know how you can do it without lying. I'm just trying to think about that out loud. I really don't know how you can do it without lying. How was it getting back to a new job? Incredibly difficult. When I got out of prison, of course, very few people wanted to hire someone that was a convicted fellow. So here's what happened, just to make it real clear. Um, I came along and I got the first job that I, somebody would hire me for, which by the way was selling cemetery property door to door. I know that you sit back and think that is one of the sexiest jobs I can ever imagine. But I got to go knocking on doors. Hi, do you realize at some point in time you're going to die? Won't you like to buy a place to put your cold dead body? And most of the time the answer was no. But you know, a blind squirrel will find an acorn from time to time and I figured, I, mom always said death and taxes, okay? And I really messed up taxes so I figured death. <laughs> Here's what in reality took place. Sure enough, that was the job I had. But I made a decision. If bad choices led to prison, then good choices will lead to something that is better. I'm not a rocket scientist. Simple-minded guy. So I decided I would be the best salesperson they had. So within the scope of nine months, I was their number one salesperson. And management came to me and they said, that's pretty impressive. Do you suppose you could teach other people to do what you do? And I said, you know, I think I probably could do that. And they made me a manager at a location. And so I taught others. And that location became the top performing location. And then they came to me and they said, do you suppose you could teach other managers how to do this? And I said, you know, I suppose I could do that. And then I was promoted to being a regional manager over two states in the United States. And those two states became top performing states. And then they came to me and they said, we seem to think you have a talent in this particular area. And they promoted me to senior vice president of sales and marketing. And in 2006, some 10 years following prison, I had gone from selling door to door to a senior VP of sales and marketing and people kept coming to me asking me this question. How is it, how is it that you're a senior VP of sales and marketing in a publicly traded company and a convicted fellow? I mean with Sarbanes-Oxley, with Enron, with WorldCom, with all of this stuff, how is it you do that? And the answer is very simple. Transparency, choices, consequences. I am not defined by the choices I made in the past. I cannot change them. But I am not defined by them. I'm defined today by the choices that I make now. And that creates the future that I want. So if I make a set of choices based upon <coughs> integrity, and honesty, then I will be able to live incredible positive consequences. Now people have asked me this question before. They said, well, if you had it to do all over again, would you do it? No. It's not a hard answer. No. Are you kidding? There's nothing about prison that's exciting. Let me share that little tidbit with you. You got to work in prison. My job was cleaning toilets and urinals. You do get paid 12 cents an hour. So my income that year was $246.54. I did not have to file a federal income tax return that year. 
But the reality of it is, no, of course I would not do that. However, as painful as that experience was, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because it helped me define who Chuck Gallagher really is. And what, is, what it is that I can bring to the world to help people see the human side of the choices that we make, the human side of ethics. And let me share with you something, and this is very important. Rationalization in the human mind is huge. If I can rationalize what I'm doing, then all of a sudden I can make it not wrong. Now, once you're thrown off the merry-go-round and everybody gets to see it, people will sit back and they'll say, how in the world did that take place? Well, it started with someone who was trying to rationalize making, I'm going to assume a few things, their assumptions, so please accept that, but they assumed they needed to make their AOP and this was a way to do it. And after all, everybody does it this way. This is not abnormal. And the next thing you know, if everybody believes that, it's not that they walked around thinking we're keeping a deep, dark secret as such. It's just the way things are done. And from an ethical perspective, sometimes you have to ask yourself the question, just because that's what's done does not make it right. And which is more valuable, doing what's right or what's done? I talk with a lot of companies, foreign and domestic, and I don't often run into someone where there is a leader that has such a high integrity value as Rob. And so it's inspiring for me to be able to hear that because I know that if the culture of the company is one of doing the right thing with high integrity, then the outcome will be the systems that are put in place that you choose will keep people between the lines. And after all, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for safety. We want people to reach their destination comfortably between the lines. So let me say this. There are a couple of things that we can do, and I'm going to just blow through these very quickly. Some may not apply as well to your organization as others. Background checks, limited access to data, sales follow-up. In a sales organization, one of the simple things that we can do, and I've been in multiple sales organizations, as I said, Senior VP of Sales and Marketing. Following up on what salespeople do with the customer at times is the way to uncover or discover what's taking place. If a salesperson believes that there will be someone independent who from time to time will follow up on the contract or the sale that is made, in many cases that is a deterrent for someone doing something wrong. Ethics training. We're in a room of managers. I will share with you, the more you can drive this down to the salespeople, the better off it becomes because when a salesperson or whomever in the organization recognizes the concept of need, opportunity, and rationalization, sometimes becoming conscious of what is subconscious will move it to the ability to get off of that proverbial um, merry-go-round. Obviously, we talk about password protection, segregation of duties, random checks. Consider lifestyle changes. If there's a dramatic lifestyle change, sometimes we should ask the question, where does that come from? How is it that that takes place? Also, be aware of need triggers. In other words, is something taking place in that person's life? Is there an illness? Is there a challenge? But is something taking place in that person's life that is creating an additional need to take place? And one of the last things I'll mention is an ethics integrity check. If there's three legs to a stool for someone who would do something wrong, here's three legs of the stool to management. Number one, if someone does something unethical, illegal, let's just leave it unethical, let's not worry about the legality right now, there should be swift and clear retribution. If people believe, if your employees believe that nothing will happen, if they do something wrong, they'll do something wrong. So that's the first thing. Second, if you identify, this is three-legged stools for you, if you identify there's a weak area within my organization, work on fixing the weak area. That's where your opportunity is. 
And the third and last thing, and this is the one that probably is the least exciting, is making sure that as managers, you subscribe to ethical standards and that you're checked. Now, often we sit back and say, really, that I'm checked. Yes, that you're checked. Because people will respect the fact that if you say, I am going to walk the walk, or talk the talk, that if, if I am going to talk the talk, I will walk the walk, and someone can inspect it, and I'm okay, because there's nothing to hide. I started off with the statement of every choice has a consequence, so let me leave you with this. Before I took the 23 steps, I thought I made good choices. Great career, a lot of positive things taking place. But when I became 11642058, I found out that every choice has a consequence. Before I took the 23 steps, frankly, I lived life as an illusion. I mean, everything seemed to be great. And 95% of it was. But boy, the 5% that wasn't really wasn't. After I became 11642058, I found out that illusions eventually go away. There's a great illusionist in the United States, David Copperfield. Wonderful shows, but it's an illusion. He's just a master illusionist. But the reality is, when the illusion's gone, he's just a person like you and I. And probably the most profound thing was, before I took those 23 steps, I thought I was successful. I had all the trappings of success. Title, cars, home, money, watches, whatever, whatever, whatever. After I became 11642058, I found out something. Success is not defined by all of those extraneous things. It's not defined by the paycheck or the card or the title, or the watch or the shoes or the clothes or the house. Success is defined by the impact that you have on other people's lives. Now, I was involved in the death business for a while. And I will say this to you very candidly. When people are leaving this earth, they're not concerned with all the things they leave behind. They are concerned with what impact did I have on someone else's life. And to live an honest, ethical life means that you will positively impact other people's lives. So let me share this with you as I close. Make the right choices. Look past the illusions and impact people's lives so you can claim your success. Thank you.